Okay, I think we should make a start. So thank you everyone for joining us um, for this um, DPLST webinar. Um, my name is Asaf Siniver. I'm Professor of International Security at the University of Birmingham. Um, I'm also Chair of the Diplomatic Studies section um, and also co-editor of the Journal of Global Security Studies. Um, the purpose of this roundtable is to, to really reflect and over, offer advice specifically to early career scholars about how to get your research on diplomacy published um, in peer-reviewed journals. And I'm very pleased, very honored to uh, be joined today by four um, outstanding scholars and, and editors of leading journals in the field. Um, I'll introduce them in the order of their appearance. So starting with Jan Melissen, who is a senior fellow at the Institute of Security and Global Affairs at Leiden University. Uh, he's also a full professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Antwerp and a faculty fellow with the Center for, Poli for Public Diplomacy at the University of Southern California. <clears throat> Jan is uh, the founding editor-in-chief uh, of the Hague Journal of Diplomacy and editor of the Diplomatic Studies book series with Brill. Um, Jan is also one of the recipients of the ISA's Distinguished, Scholars, uh, Distinguished Scholar Award in Diplomatic Studies uh, back in 2022. Um, Christine Haugevik is a research professor at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs in Oslo. Her research revolves around international diplomacy, interstate cooperation and friendship with a geographical focus on, Euro -Atlantic, on the Euro-Atlantic region and the foreign policies of Britain and the Nordic States. And since 2023, since last year, Christine has been the editor-in-chief uh, for cooperation and conflict. Alvard Lyra is also a research professor in the International Relations, sorry, research professor of International Relations at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Uh, he has been part of establishing the, the subfield of historical international relations, and his research has covered diplomacy, foreign policy, conceptual history, international thought, and international order. Uh, Harvard is currently associate editor uh, of both the Hague Journal of Diplomacy and the European Journal of International Relations. And finally, Andrew Dorman, uh, who is a professor of international security at King's College London, based at the UK's Defence Academy. Uh, Andrew is the editor of International Affairs, published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House. So I've asked each of our four participants to perhaps start with a, a very short um, introduction uh, on, on for specific topics, if you like, to do with the, the, the process of, of, of getting published, and then we'll follow it up with Q&A and a general discussion. Um, I've asked Jan to, to reflect on what makes a good article in the field of diplomatic studies. Uh, it's an incredibly broad question, but if anyone can answer it, I'm sure Jan can. Um, Christine will provide us a sort of a general overview, if you like, of the intake and the review process when the manuscript has been submitted to a journal, what happens then. Um, Harvard very kindly has um, agreed to discuss desk rejection. So what happens, uh, or more importantly, why is your paper um, was desk rejected? One kind, what kind of deliberations going on behind the scenes? Um, and just as importantly as the author, how to deal with rejection. Uh, and finally, Andrew will talk about r, &R decisions, um, how to respond to um, the decision letter from the editors to the comments from the, the reviewers. Uh, and what can you do to make sure that um, you present your revised uh, manuscript in good order? So I've spoken enough. Um, let's start with Dian, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asaf, and uh, thank you very much for this uh, initiative. Uh, it's it's wonderful to meet you all here. Uh, also to see my my fellow editors here. Uh, we have too few of these discussions, I think, within journals, between journals. And so this is a wonderful opportunity. And of course, it's great to um, have a discussion with our authors as well. I think I can say this on behalf of everything. Our authors are our capital. It's just the, the, the most important thing that's most dear uh, to, the, to the journal. So Asaf, thank you for handing me the mother of all questions that what's a good article in diplomatic studies uh, on, on diplomacy. And um, I've, I'm trying to target this uh, towards an audience, as you are saying, of early career uh, authors. 
I suppose that people in this audience typically would not be people who already have a dozen articles in international journals, but indeed uh, early career authors or very dissatisfied authors who see an opportunity to, uh, to talk to us uh, di directly. Uh, all are welcome in this conversation. So I would like to say first, uh, uh, rather than what's a good article, what's my dream article? Uh, the dream article uh, on diplomacy would for me be an article uh, that reflects this academic field, the evolution of evolution of this academic field uh, um, with great academic diversity and, and new generations uh, adding their, their voice. Uh, all this from, from across the world also, and I think I can speak on behalf of all journals, that we are looking increasingly for that diversity of authorship where we also are prepared to do our share of, of uh, mentoring uh, in the process because writing an article is, as we all know, is a process and enthusiastic engagement in that process. I think on both sides, uh, on the side of the editor and certainly the journal and uh, with the, the, the authors and the reviewers is a recipe for, for success. Secondly, I think my, my dream article would be an article written by an author who believes in the principles of open science uh, and engagement with wider readership. Uh, uh, so broadening out the academic community and the products of the academic community and sharing them with a wider field, I think is increasingly on the agenda and, and appeals to, uh, to younger authors uh, who no longer see themselves as uh, people who aspire to climbing up the ladder of small citation communities. Um, so that, I think, uh, thirdly, uh, um, the ideal, the dream article would be the article uh, by the author who is further opening up this field, uh, theoretically and, and empirically, uh, which is really, uh, we see now, there's a lot of early uh, uh, career scholarship, that is really going theoretically in, in fascinating directions. And uh, the, the field has grown exponentially. It's quite, quite fascinating in, in that respect. Of course, without forgetting what has been achieved uh, so far. So answering the question, what would be a good article? I think runs the risk of saying things that everybody already knows. Everybody who's, been, uh, who's written essays, a BA dissertation, an MA dissertation, a PhD dissertation, you come across, across similar things. But some point still I would like to, to single out, it's very evident that you really zoom in on the journal, journal that you like, that, that you sympathize with, and that you understand what they are looking for. Otherwise, you're being kicked out as an article with an article that's too short, too long, uh, uh, out of scope. It still happens. And of course, here, the Hague Journal of Diplomacy is within a relatively small niche, and at the same time, catering for, for an enormous breadth of articles. On, on diplomacy. Um, um, I would say then, then um, of course, we are looking for original work. This is again, such an obvious, uh, obvious point to make, but, but it's, it's an important point. And this also comes back in certain elements of an article where an early career author, for instance, uh, um, does a literature review. That literature review should read like a fresh and original review related to the research question, not going through the motions of a review that we have read before in other places. Sometimes I feel that authors uh, and early career authors are hesitant to make their claims very clearly and making that claim very clearly is important for an article and it comes back in all sections of the article, uh, uh, sometimes even in the title and the abstract and conclusions uh, uh, throughout it. And that claim uh, should be, of course, be supported uh, empirically. Um, I've asked this question also to, to in, in our team, in the Hague Journal of Diplomacy, we work with a team of editors uh, across, the, uh, across the globe. And some of these, so some of these points are, are, have come up in, in our, our discussion. I would like to add to that, that uh, uh, indeed claims should be supported empirically, but sometimes because of all the ingredients of a, of a scholarly article, there may be a tendency among authors to shrink the empirical part. And I just feel that we lose very valuable material uh, uh, when that shrinking uh, uh, is, is going too far. And uh, added to that, I'd like to say that when it comes to methodology, uh, uh, um, this field is no field of methodological orthodoxy. 
it's across disciplines. Uh, certainly for my own journal, we have an editorial team across continents. So there is not one, one model uh, um, um, to go for. Also, we feel that the, the research design of an article is something that should be clear, it should be understandable, it should be effective, uh, but not a goal in its, in its own right. And again, not something that should absorb too much of the piece that you are submitting. Clarity throughout is, of course, always important. Uh, uh, and that goes for the, the research design and for everybody, every other part. Uh, uh, um, writing is about communication. And if uh, your readers have to struggle to understand uh, what you mean, uh, I, I think that we're in, in a difficult spot with, with articles. And, uh, and so that's what also what, what our reviewers say. The, what we think of an article, a good article, is of course also very much determined by the reviewers. And what we do, we send uh, an article goes to a minimum of two reviewers, more in practice, because you never know in advance whether a viewer, a reviewer is going to deliver and what the quality is of that, of that review. Also, we find that in all fairness, we should look that, that an article gets a fair review by looking at diversity of reviewers, and certainly also by including a reviewer who understands sort of the litmus test in our journal. Is this an article on diplomacy or is it just an article on international politics, current, current affairs, uh, foreign, foreign policy? So that's sort of the, 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 the game uh, uh, that we, we do with, with, with good articles. Um, I've already made the point on the, the literature review. It is uh, very important, of course, that authors know their literature, that they know other literatures, that they connect articles on diplomacy uh, with different fields of study so, uh, across across disciplines. Uh, uh, so that is uh, definitely something we look at, at seriously. So uh, um, yeah, a good article reflects, as I said right at the start, as the, the curiosity and intellectual interest uh, of new generations of authors that help open up a field that has grown exponentially in the past uh, uh, 20 years. And like the other journals, uh, uh, we welcome those new authors uh, and we're very much, you see it as our task also to guide them through the dialogue uh, of making a good article better. So the best article is the article of the author who really enjoys the dialogue and really enjoys uh, the process of making this a, a much better product than that what was originally uh, submitted. Uh, uh, and we're all proud. Uh, I think we editors are sort of a weird kind of species because we are constantly very proud of the work that other people are doing rather than just our own individual work. Uh, and that makes this a beautiful job. Thank you. Thanks, Jan, that's a great start. You see, I told you, if anyone could answer that question, um, that would be you. Um, over to you, Christine, please. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you for organizing this. I, I, I always like going to these kind of panels myself, so I'm happy to, to be part of one. Um, and let me just start by saying that I'm, in the, uh, I'm one of the editors in chief of Cooperation Conflict. If uh, people don't know the journal, it's owned by the Nordic International Studies Association. It's uh, published by SAGE. And it's currently run by a team from NUPI, where I also work. So it's me who is one of the editors in chief, and it's also Benjamin de Cavallo. And we have two associate editors, uh, Paul Vermont and Avin Svensson. And we took over, this team took over in June 2023. So we are still pretty fresh, I think. We are still sort of uh, publishing the backlog of, our, of the previous editors, but we are slowly and, and, and surely uh, getting more of our own stuff and, and our own profile on the journal. Uh, so Cooperation Conflict has uh, traditionally published, I would say, international relations uh, material with a Nordic touch. Uh, in recent years, I would say it's less Nordic oriented in geography, but that is still sort of a central part of what it covers. So there will be a leaning towards uh, the Nordic region, I think, in terms of what is, is submitted to us uh, of case studies and, and focus and so on. I took a, a quick look now, and we do not get a lot of articles from diplomacy studies, I would say, and this is a message to the people who are attending in the audience, that there is room for more. Um, and the, the stuff that is published on diplomacy in, in COCO uh, seems to be 
uh, more generally oriented than perhaps the stuff that is published in, in the Hague Journal of Diplomacy, where I think it's much more diplomacy centered. Whereas in Coco, you would probably see more of the stuff that has an international relations outlook and then diplomacy perhaps more as the, as the case study or, or the, the sort of empirics presented. I found seven articles mentioning diplomacy since we took over in June. Uh, that's not a lot. So again, there's room for more. Uh, but I, I think probably too that diplomacy scholars uh, sometimes like to publish uh, their stuff in, in journals where they know that other diplomacy scholars are reading and engaging with their work. Uh, so that probably has to, has to do uh, or explain something. But Cooperation and Conflict is absolutely a journal where diplomacy work could find a good home and I think also a broad readership. Uh, and we particularly appreciate critical contributions that speak to the main So we would like uh, the people who submit stuff on, that relate to or are about diplomacy to also think about whether uh, the issues and the research questions they bring up can also address a broader audience and engage with broader debates uh, in our field. Uh, and once again, the critical approach is, is at, at heart of what cooperation and conflict does. Now, I was asked to talk about the general description of how, how the, the process from submitting a, a journal article and, and to sending it out to review, how that happens. Um, so I can only speak, of course, on behalf of Coco, but I imagine that what I have to say will apply to the other journals as well. Uh, and the first thing is, you know, you, you should submit your article through our website. Do not pre-submit it in any way by email or 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 other other ways the best way is to submit it through the scholar one system uh, and we uh, do as, as Jan said you know it, it's important before you decide to submit an article to cooperation conflict please read our profile description look at recently published article and and try to to decide in advance whether you think your theme and your research question is a good fit with uh, what the journal is publishing and the kinds of debates that are going on, going on in there. Uh, and that includes also submitting the article in the right formal, format. If it's too long or too short, it is likely to be uh, desk rejected on technical grounds. I'm sure Halvard will talk about this uh, later on. Um, in COCO, nothing is decided by one person only. So when articles are submitted, we try to read through everything within one to two weeks. Uh, and uh, usually if, if the, uh, a decision to desk reject an article is made, then that's always checked by, by two people. So the one editor in chief will read the incoming articles then the other editor in chief will sign it off. So that's, uh, that should be also a guarantee that we sort of err on the author's side if, if there's doubt. So then we will send the article on if it's otherwise a good fit. Um, if the article passes this first uh, first uh, test or this first barrier, then we will assign an associate editor, which then in the next step will send the article out for review. We usually uh, send out to two reviewers, but sometimes three, depending on, on the issue at stake and, and uh, what kind of article it is. Uh, and of course, when we choose our reviewers, we are mindful of conflicts of interest. So we wouldn't send it out to your institution colleague. Uh, we wouldn't send it out to your supervisor or, or anyone you have co-authored with, for example. Uh, and we also have a, a quite broad editorial board. And sometimes we lean on their expertise as well to, for example, suggest reviewers that are, are within the field. And we also have an, a very good editorial assistant who can help us um, sorting out the different different types of candidates and, and checking out also possibilities in that regard. Um, I would say it is not too difficult to, to pass, pass the desk review stage at COCO, although we unfortunately do have to, to desk re uh, review some of the articles that come to us. But I'd say uh, the key criteria relates to whether you have a puzzle or and a clear research question. I think having a question that you respond to in the article is, is essential. Uh, originality, I think y'all mentioned this as well. Um, some, some kind of aspect that explains to the reader why this piece of work adds something to ongoing debates. And it doesn't always have to be a new theory or a completely new field or you know criticizing everything that has been said until this point, but there has to be 
uh, some argument convincing the reader that uh, what is what is uh, written here is not precisely the same as something that has been written written before. Um, and there has to be, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there has to be also a good so, something we consider to be a good fit with the journal's profile. So if it's something that we consider to be not international relations at all or not international politics at all, then uh, we may suggest to the author that they submit their articles somewhere else. Um, also, and I, I, I think I should mention this because that is a, a key reason why many articles do not pass the needle's eye, and that is that there should be something in the article for it to be published in cooperation conflict. There should be something beyond uh, one single case. So if it's a very detailed case study description, it might be an excellent article, but we are uh, leaning towards being a generalist uh, journal, uh, as I said, international relations specialized. So sometimes we desk project good articles because we consider them not to be a good fit with the journal profile. Um, and, and the second thing is, is also that we are uh, mindful of reviewers time. I think uh, peer reviewers are under increasing time pressure these days, uh, having to do, and, and this is also a service that we all do to the discipline. It's not something that is paid or something that is, is sort of rewarded. It's, it's also anonymized, uh, but um, uh, so, so that too, of course, means that we cannot send everything out for review, um, even if we would have wanted to. The double blind, um, and I'm, I'm sure the, pe the people in the audience are aware uh, of, of this, the double blind review process simply means that we anonymize the author uh, before we send out, uh, we, we anonymize the author before we send the manuscript out for review. And of course, the identity of the reviewers is not revealed back to the authors either. Uh, and this makes it important, of course, that the editorial team and the editorial assistants are very uh, careful uh, when we uh, choose the reviewers, uh, as I said, to avoid conflicts of interest, that you would have people who already know who the author is or, or, um, or know the work or have reviewed it before. We, we usually try to find uh, reviewers who complement one another, who can comment on different aspects of the manuscript. Um, and we are also mindful of the uh, expertise and, and competencies we have within the editorial team, uh, so that if there is if this is a topic that none of us are very skilled in, then we will try to bring in reviewers who could help us say something additional. Um, a final point is that we are working now on a new early career initiative where we uh, suggest that we will, and I think this is sim similar to something that international affairs already has established, uh, where we'll offer extra supervision. Uh, to uh, early career authors who would like to submit their manuscript to cooperation conflict. And when we see potential and an important contribution, we would be willing to uh, work a bit extra with, with that author to help them into making something publishable. I think I'll stop there. That's great. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, Harvard, you're going to play the bad cop and, and tell, us about, tell us about rejections. Yeah, specifically about desk rejections. <laughs> um, just to add, I'm, I'm currently associate editor of, of the Hague Journal of Diplomacy and EJIR, the European Journal of International Relations. I'll base my comments now primarily on the EJIR experience. Um, for those of you who don't know, EJIR is owned by, co-owned by the, the um, EISA, the European International Studies Association, and the ECPR, the European Consortium for Political Research. It's been uh, in the field since 1995. Um, our team, which has people from Erfurt, Antwerp, and Oslo, has been doing this for a little over two years. Um, so that means I've desk projected a lot. Um, but the good question I was supposed to answer to is why are papers desk projected? And I'll start by saying a little about some structural features that sort of um, condition desk projects. And then I'll talk about some specific paper uh, challenges. So at EJR, we are able to publish around somewhere between 8 and 10% of the articles we receive. That's just sort of the bottom line. Um, this is similar to, to other sort of overall generalist journals in the field. Some have even higher desk re rejection rates, some have lower rejection rates. But still, we the starting assumption for any article is that it most likely will not be uh, printed in the journal. So the immediate question you ask as, a, as the first reader of an article is, does this article have the potential to make it in the end? 
since most will not make it in the end, you have to make a sort of early decision. Is this, this is, is there something here? And they're looking for the stuff that that Jan mentioned, the stuff that Kristen mentioned. That what is there something here that that speaks to um, you as a reader? You think that this is might be of interest uh, to the discipline, um, to our readers. Um, I would also like to emphasize again what Kristen said about reviewer fatigue. This is very, very real. It can be hard to find reviewers. Um, I think across journals from speaking to other editors, this has led to an increase in desk rejects. There's a one factor is the, the, the increasing number of papers, the number of papers as the discipline has grown over the last 20 years, the numbers of papers have also increased. Um, and um, there's this feeling among editors that Kristen mentioned that we cannot really burn our reviewers on long shot articles. Articles that might have been sent out for review 10, 15 years ago might not be sent out for review today simply because there are so many articles around and there's sort of the unwillingness to burn reviewers on articles that we sort of don't think will make it in the end. So a, a structuralist plea from me as an editor to, to uh, uh, scholars of all stripes really is do not use journals just to get feedback. I know this is a common uh, suggestion that oh send out your send out your paper you'll get feedback on it even if it's not published. That's really sort of abusing reviewers and editors' time. Uh, if it's if you don't think it's finished, work on finishing it and get colleagues, friends, whatever to read it. Do not burn the time and resources of uh, journals and editor, editors and reviewers. This is all voluntary work. We're not paid to do it. And it's a service. And I think we need all need to be careful about how we uh, spend that capital. So moving on to each paper, why are papers rejected? There is, well, the first and simplest one is lack of fit. Uh, Kristen mentioned that uh, the EJR is a generalist journal. So we are interested in a lot of things. And we have published uh, over the years, many, many articles on diplomacy, important, uh, typically theoretical or historical work on diplomacy. Um, I will say, though, that articles in EJR, are much like in cooperation and conflict, they must speak to something above uh, and beyond themselves. Uh, so uh, pure area studies articles, articles which are clearly sort of geared towards uh, policy, um, Single country studies, if not anchored more broadly, are things that will typically get desk rejected, not necessarily because they're bad, but because they simply do not speak to any, anything above and beyond themselves. So for articles on diplomacy, that would typically be if you're doing a single country study of a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, one diplomatic service, something like that. It will be probably be hard to frame that in a way that will make it re, uh, sort of sellable to our wider audience. Not impossible. Because you can make theoretical uh, or broader arguments based on a single country, but that work needs to be done. You can't just present, look at what I found from this country X, Y, Z. That will not fly. Then, of course, there's the question of quality. And quality is, again, something that's hard to define, but there are some very, very common features that we see. The first one would be that the, the central contribution is not clear. We get too many articles where there's not actually not entirely clear what the argument is. What is it that this paper helps you understand beyond the specific case or the empirical material? What is the argument that you're making? Why should the reader want to read this? Um, that's the first sort of very basic question. The second, also quite common thing, is that the the central argument isn't strong enough and streamlined enough. I mean, we print articles up to 12,000 words so we can you have some space to actually elaborate on points, but it should really be one central argument uh, around which the entire paper is uh, structured. Uh, many articles try to make too many arguments. Uh, you can't really sort of develop new theory, criticize other theories, present three different cases, compare them and reach a conclusion. That's just too much, right? Focus on what is the central uh, contribution you're making. The second is that there's a tendency, I think, to have a, a not not a strong enough connection between a theoretical argument and empirical material. Uh, some articles are theory overloaded with empirics not really uh, making the case. Others are empirically overloaded with the theories sort of seems to be slapped on. Um, 
the empirical material needs to relate to the theoretical claims. So, and common to a number of articles I have read over the years now is, is they're trying to do too much. Um, sometimes I get the suspicion that this is a condensed PhD. Now, I absolutely urge people to publish work from their PhDs, but try to do that as do not condense your entire PhD into a, one article. Pick out one ar argument from your PhD and build an argument around that from your PhD. That's perfectly fine. But there is no room to condense. There's a reason why a PhD thesis is, is uh, 10 times longer than a journal article, right? Because there's more going on. That's sort of reasons for desk rejects. Now, at EJR, much like um, uh, in cooperation, co cooperation and conflict, we always have two pairs of eyes uh, for every decision. So if it's desk rejected, two people have argued that this is, shouldn't be published. Uh, if one editor thinks it's a desk reject and, and some, some other thinks, well, there might be something here, we'll send it out. We'll, we'll try to sort of err on the side of the author uh, on these things. Um, but again, that also means that if you, your article has been desk rejected with us, it's probably because it wouldn't be a good fit. It would, it's, not, it's not strong enough. Two different people have agreed on that. How should one deal with this, uh, a desk reject? A desk reject is never something you want to have. Um, and speaking as an author myself, my first inclination would probably be to think that the editors are very, very stupid. They don't understand uh, my brilliance. Um, well, um, that might be so, but I think uh, it's a desk we always try to write desk rejects where which, which are more than just a line saying you've been desk rejected. I, uh, we always try to provide sort of at least sort of a few pointers. Now, again, we receive a very large number of articles, so we can't write long uh, notes on why things have been desk rejected, but authors should at least take away something from our desk rejects. So if it's a bad fit, we'll say that, that this might be a better fit for a different kind of journal. Sometimes we suggest journals or types of journals. Um, that is. I would think that's typically a good hint. If if the editor thinks that your article is out of scope, you're probably sending it to the wrong kind of journal. If it's not a good fit for EJR, it's probably also not a good fit for International Studies Quarterly or Corporation of Conflict. It might be a very good fit for other types of journals, so don't despair on that. Um, the other thing is the, is the quality. If you get feedback like along the lines of what I uh, laid out of the, the quality of papers, uh, then I think the wise move would be to actually sort of say, okay, what is the argument that I'm making? Am I making it strong enough? Is it clear enough? Um, what is the connection between the, the, the theory and the empirics? Those kinds of questions. Um, and again, take that. Um, most papers that we receive have something in them. There's something. There are very, very few papers that I receive that I think this should just go back in the drawer and never see the day of light. Most papers have something in them. Um, and hopefully after a desk reject, you will go back and say, this something is what I need to focus on. I need to build around that and I need to send it to an appropriate outlet for that journal. Thus the desk reject can be constructive and useful uh, in your research process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. Very much, uh, very well said. Um, over to you, Andrew, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the audience and for, the, uh, for organising this. Um, I've been given the task of looking at revise and resubmits and how we should respond. First thing I should say is be positive about this. You've got a revise and resubmit. You've got through, you haven't been death rejected. You've got a revise and resubmit is a really positive thing. There are very, very few articles that get submitted, go out for review and come back and the, the reviewer said, it's perfect, don't make a change. At the very least, they come back with minor revisions. So revise and resubmit is a really positive thing. It's quite normal once you've got past the desk reject stage. So embrace it. Don't think, I've got revise and resubmit. That's it. I give up. I'm not going to do it ever again. You, you're in a really positive place. Having said that, don't make the second mistake, which often some people make, which is going, well, it's almost there. So I could basically ignore if I, all I have to do is a couple of tweaks and then send it back and it will be accepted. That is a great way to get it rejected at that point. So there is no guarantee with a revise and resubmit that your piece has, will be accepted. As, you know, some of the statistics have already been banded about. A significant number of pieces will be desk rejected. 
they were then competing within a smaller cohort for those pieces that will ultimately come into a journal and be accepted for that journal. So be positive, don't be complacent. Look at what the reviewers have each said. Now they haven't each seen what each other has said and look at what the editorial team have said as a result. Um, a good reviewer is gonna go in and point out things and every piece we write can be improved. Get another pair of eyes on it, it can be improved. So take what they say positively, and they often come up with great suggestions, but you've got to be realistic about what they say. So have a look at what the editorial team say in terms of guidance, because they might say, this is really great, can you add another gap case study? Well, you might not have space within the, the limitations of what that journal allows in terms of word count, for example. So look at the guidance you get from the editorial team. Don't be totally surprised sometimes when you get two or three reviewers come in and they suggest different things, because, as it's already been said, we often choose a editorial group of, with different expertise. So one might be more theoretically orientated, one might be more expert on the case study you're looking at, for example. So they will tend to focus on what is their area of expertise and their recommendations. So look at what they've said, take it on board, that they are sensible. Um, general, you know, we, we hopefully have, have chosen people who know something about the subject and give you really positive feedback. So think about what they've said. And think about the constraints and look at the editorial guidance. The editorial team will also give guidance. They might say, really look at what reviewer one has said. You can largely ignore what reviewer two has said. Pick up the three points from reviewer three. Have a look at, they will give you a, a, a feel for what to think about. And if you have a big query that you, you're not sure about in terms of response, you can ask the editorial team and say, I'm not sure. Do I really need to add a case study? Do I not? What do you think? Uh, you can engage with the editorial team which leads me on to how to respond. My advice is to make it easy because often if a piece is going back, it's got major revisions, it will go back to the same reviewers to review how you've done it and it will go back to the editorial team to have a look at how they've considered it. So I suggest a two column approach, put, get a, effectively set up a Word document or whatever, two columns, one, on one side of the column, write each point. So it also serves as a great checklist. So reviewer one had three points, A, B, and C. Reviewer two had five points, one, two, three, four, five. And then on the right-hand side, say how you dealt with each of those points. Or if you felt that actually one, it was inappropriate or the wrong to say, say so and why. Because if you think of it from a reviewer or an editorial team's point of view, they can see how you address the issues that have been raised. That's what they're looking for. So if you do a two column page, it's easy. We can it make sure that you've covered all the queries that they've raised. You can see how you've responded to it. Um, in terms of timelines, often there's an automated timeline will be put in by a journal for how quickly you respond. Um, they won't know how busy you are. So if you need more time, you can often request more time. That's often acceptable unless you're a part of a special section or edition and there is a particular timeline. But I would also encourage you to respond timely. Don't put it aside for six months and then go back to it because things do change and you might forget about things. So keep the momentum going with this. The final point I'd make when it comes to re revise and resubmit is to have a look at the journal itself and, the more, and other journals about what has been published on your subject in the meantime. You will have submitted at a point in time. It'll have gone out for a review. If it's come back quite quickly, that's probably at least one and a half to two months gone by. Other pieces have come out, it can be a longer period. What you don't want to do is have a piece written, you adjusted the feedback and then three other pieces have been just been written in that journal on that subject that you it completely ignored. You need to engage with those. So have a quick look at the journal itself. Has there been anything more written on that subject in, in, in you're writing about? In the meantime, just so you can make sure you're, you can link into that. But I emphasize, revise and resubmit is a really positive thing. Don't think of it as a rejection itself. This is, you've got over the next hurdle. We've got one final hurdle to go. And with that, I'll better stop, so we've got time for Q&A. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Andrew. Right, we've got plenty of time for Q&A and sort of follow-up discussion. So um, I'll just feed out um, some of the questions. We'll start with the first one. Um, could the panelists speak to the costs involved in publishing in journals, uh, not necessarily financial costs, but in terms of advice, funding opportunities, uh, and so on? So I presume specifically it speaks to obviously ECRs, but I guess particularly um, as well scholars in the global south who perhaps do not have um, 
the institutional support, um, um, paywalls, and those kind of things, and um, to help them to 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 get the first um, research published in journals. So, what can we do? What do we do as journal editors to address these um, issues? Yes, Andrew. On the financial side, I think most journals, unless they are pure open access journals, operate with some degree of a, a, a paywall. So, if, I mean, social affairs, we wouldn't charge anybody for a piece that we accept. But if you want it to be in front of the paywall, then there will be an open access charge associated with that. So we're not going to financially charge you for publishing your piece, but we will charge you if you want it in front of the paywall um, and the rates are displayed there. And that's I think, quite common for most journals. Um, in terms of the cost of right, since the in terms of time and effort, there is time and effort, and there's no guarantee of re results. You can put a lot of effort into writing a piece, and it doesn't get accepted somewhere. Uh, there is no guarantee in this world. Um, equally, the one guarantee is if you don't submit and produce these things, then you're not going to have the benefit of engaging and getting your word out there. So there is no promise of what you write actually being published. But unless, if you don't write it, your, your voice is, is, is being lost. So it's an cap, individual calculation. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Would anyone, in, would anyone else like to jump on this? Or should we move on to the next question? Um, so there's, this is a, quite a long question, so I'll try to be uh, quick, but it's about um, the link between diplomats, practitioners and, and, and academics in, in relation to, to published articles. So how can journals become more relevant to diplomats and how do you motivate focused research um, or the best brains in the field to write for you? Uh, usually they're busy doing other things. Uh, do your journals think about overcoming these huge gaps between what diplomats, academics and trainers or lecturers need and can offer in order to affect diplomatic practice? Um, Yang, would you like to take it, please? Yeah, happy to take that question. Uh, very close to my heart, uh, uh, um, because I think it's important for us to reach out, as I made clear in my introduction, to a, uh, a broader uh, readership without doing any concession to the academic rigor and theoretical ambitions uh, and all the other qualities of our work. Uh, uh, so reaching out to practitioners is, is part of what I see as a, a science communication role that we have uh, uh, and part of it, an emerging discussion on open science, uh, that the work that we do is relevant for stakeholders who mutually see ourselves as their, their stakeholders. Uh, and you can do that in a number of ways. And, and of course, the Hague Journal of Diplomacy is definitely not the only journal doing that, but we see it as an important mission to try and encourage authors to think of the, the spin-off of their work or the, the summaries of their work or the core of the argument of the work uh, of the work and communicate that uh, to a wider readership uh, through blogs, uh, through podcasts, uh, other products, uh, webinars that are specifically designed as uh, places uh, where practitioners uh, and authors meet. Um, also within, within the journal, uh, the articles, uh, we are very much aware that academics tend to write for academics and for students, uh, and that uh, many practitioners don't have the, the time to read. Uh, they would rather do something else than pick up an academic journal. But there are ways of, of, of getting through, and that is also to be more flexible um, with the kind of articles that we offer. Uh, um, in, in the case of AJD, that's the traditional research, original research article. But we're also trying to, um, um, rather than just being in an inbox that is doing proper reviewing, uh, try and help uh, shape the field uh, to, to a modest extent uh, that that we can uh, by thinking of special issues that have a broader appeal. Uh, um, I can give one example, a special issue that we've done on space diplomacy was of particular interest to academics as well as practitioners. And, and the day that we organized this symposium on space diplomacy was actually very much uh, geared towards the interests of, uh, of uh, stakeholders in the huge business of, of space. Also different types of articles uh, um, where uh, the, the, the forums that are short, argumentative essays, more argumentative essays are around a certain theme are typically the kind of articles that 
inspire further research, but that also appeal to practitioners. So I think it's it's indeed an important mission for us as we see it, but uh, it's certainly appeals also to some of the other journals uh, like International Affairs uh, that we encourage authors to think about the policy implications, not necessarily it doesn't apply to all articles, uh, but indeed uh, to think of the relevance of diplomacy uh, uh, to international politics, uh, to not see the field slide away in a direction where hobbyists uh, uh, seem to be obliv oblivious of what's going on in the world out there. That's what you don't want. So this, this interplay between academia uh, uh, and, uh, and practice is a very relevant one. And uh, as I mentioned with a couple of keywords uh, like open science, I think it's, it's part of, of an important emerging debate uh, where early career scholars uh, have an important role to play. Thank you, Jan. Uh, we've got lots of good questions coming in and we don't necessarily have to stop on the hour. Um, obviously, if some of the panelists have to leave, that, that's absolutely fine, but um, we'll, we'll try to answer all of your questions because they're all really good ones. Um, so there's a question about AI tools, and obviously ChatGPT and other tools have been very popular over the last you know, couple of years. Um, so would the presenters please advise on uh, the editing recommendations, grammar and substance, but I presume also more broadly, um, should authors be um, running away from ChatGPT? Can they use them? And if they can use them, should they declare the fact that they've used them and in what capacity? Um, I know that as Jog's editor, which is an ISA journal, um, all ISA journals have the policy that um, um, you have to tick the box. So when you, when you submit your, your article to an ISA journal, you have to confirm that you have or have not uh, used um, AI tools. And if you have, you need to specify in what capacity. Was it in the literature review? Was it to polish up the grammar and so on? But again, that's just my experience at ISA. Um, would anyone like to take this question? Yeah, yeah, please. Yes, only very briefly, and 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 I think we can speak frankly that we're at the beginning of a conversation where also universities are trying to make up their minds what this means to them. Uh, but I think on the labor market, uh, um, and when we look at our students, our students, I think as a rule, will consider using AI tools in one form or another in the preparatory process for their work. And whether that those AI tools are stupid uh, assistance or intelligence assistance, uh, uh, you can, you can, it's, I think it is a reality also for people uh, entering employment uh, that they, they work in a space where AI tools are simply a, a given. Uh, so how to go about that? I think you mentioned it already, uh, um, ask authors to make this explicit as we do in the classroom as well uh, is, is a very good, good way forward, but it's definitely, uh, uh, where we cannot stick our head in the sand, we have to to engage in this discussion. Thank you, Jan. So I'll, I try to group three questions together now about things to do and not do in terms of R and R. Um, so the first one um, about revise and resubmit. Uh, I think Andrew is typing the answer to, to the question, but I'll ask it for everyone's benefit. Um, about revise and resubmit. If we disagree with the reviewer's comment and respond to him or her, I disagree with you, is this a negative point? That's one question. The second one um, um, was about uh, what happens when, um, as editors, we receive one review that is uh, very positive. For example, it can be a minor, um, and the other one is either reject or a major. So what do we do? Is there a default um, decision there? Do we always go with the more um, critical review? How do we balance the two? Do we submit it to send it to a third reviewer and so on? Um, and then there's another question about um, what are certain uh, four paths that um, early career scholars should avoid making when they're uh, submitting their um, articles to a journal and engaging with the editors? So three questions there. Um, who would like to, to go first? Yeah, Harvard, please. Yeah, I think... Um... The the uh, key point is it's perfectly okay to disagree with reviewers. I mean that's that's fine, um, but you need to then make the argument why you think that the. I mean sometimes it's simply that there is a sort of academic disagreement, 
And sometimes the, then your job as an editor is to sort of weigh that is sort of have you made a is is this your rejection of this point is this valid or is it just that you feel differently right because now I've been sort of handling editor on articles that we have published in EJR where one of the reviewers was reacting very strongly against one of the arguments made in the article and as an editorial team then we just overrule that so this is actually sort of this is not this this is not resolvable because this is foundational disagreement so if the reviewer wants to respond that's perfectly fine in a, in a separate article or a discussion piece or something but um, if, if to put it very briefly if, if your your author is a, a scientific realist and your your reviewer is not that sort of that's not a ground for rejecting an article it's perfectly okay i think to to then say that in your response letter uh, second on, on on whether you're only getting articles with uh, strong likes and dislikes from the from the reviewers then typically you would start by saying okay are, are there again are there some beefs here uh, is this a strong reaction positive or negative because i've picked sort of quote unquote the wrong reviewers have i picked someone who's very antithetical to this or very pro this and then, then the review is probably not that helpful but then it comes down to editorial sometimes then you ask for a third reviewer right you sort of okay i need someone else i need someone who is not sort of deep into this you might reach out to an editorial board say i i need sort of a a judgment call here but you would also always uh, ask the other editors of the journal saying how do you think we should weigh this and these are actually the, some of the most difficult decisions we make because um but i think my my typical reaction would be that i would tend again to err on the side of the author and i would tend to send it out for uh, another round of of, of uh, revisions and I might not go back to the original uh, reviewers. Thank you, Halbert. Um, anyone else on that? Uh, Christine first, and then Andrew. Anyone? Uh, so yes, I, th I think I would very much agree with with Halbert's point there. I think it's perfectly fine to disagree with the reviewers' comment, and I think uh, I think Andrew alluded to this as well. They simply list the points and and explain, you know, what you decided to do with the article. And then also what you decided not to do. And sometimes it could be also that you acknowledge the reviewer's point, but to address it would simply mean rewriting the entire article or losing some other important parts of the article. And I think that's fine as long as as, as there's a, there's reasoning behind it. And, and you can sort of convince the editor that it's, it is uh, fine to leave this aspect aside and maybe address it at some later point. And of course, it's it's not the case that reviewers are always right. Uh, and sometimes reviewers disagree with one another, as the second question pointed out. Uh, and in those cases where you have one positive and one negative review or pointing in different directions, uh, I think in COCO2, we would tend to, to err on the author's side. In cases like that, we, we discuss within the editorial team. And, and we figure out collectively, we always have one associate editor, and one um, uh, editor-in-chief on, on every article. And, and so that's where the discussion begins, but we can bring in other members of the team. We can bring in members of the editorial board if we would want the, the second opinion. And sometimes we would also send it out to, to a third reviewer if, if we are very much in doubt uh, what to do to make sure that the author does, does get a proper process. Uh, the third question, I think, was about uh, mistakes. Was it uh, sort of rookie mistakes? Um, so, so I think for that, I, I think I would avoid sending in an article where the sort of the style is is not a journal article style. So, if you if you send in something that looks like a thesis, for example, then we we may feel that you know it hasn't been adapted enough to 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 be suitable for sending out for review. And I wouldn't submit anything without a question or a puzzle because that's usually what it what it takes. And I sometimes look, you know, where is where is the question? What is the theme here? If it's simply descriptive, if it's simply simply interesting information about the theme, uh, then th that's not sufficient. There has to be some sort of problem, some sort of puzzle uh, which is being addressed. Uh, and then finally, you know, uh, avoid being technically desk rejected. So make sure that, you know, you don't, as I said earlier, I think send in something that is way too long or way too short, because that's, that's a sure sign that you may not even be considered by the editor in chief because it will be rejected by the editorial assistant before it's it's moved on. Uh, so those would be my points, I think. Thank you, Christian. Can I just jump in, Andrew, quickly? Um, I mean, for me, as a general editor, the biggest sort of rookie mistake, and I'm sure most people are aware of it, 
but anyway, is um, only submit one manuscript to one journal at a time. Do not send your manuscript to more than one journal at a time. I know sometimes it can take a while. It can take up to three months sometimes to get a decision if it's not a desk rejection. Um, but you've got to be patient. You've got to be patient. You don't want to burn your bridges. It's it's As rookie mistakes go, I think this is possibly the biggest one because, you know, general editors talk to one another and it doesn't, it's not a good look um, if you seem to to be circumventing, if you like, the, the review process by sending the same manuscript to two journals at the same time. Um, but over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Endorse what I have just said. And in our experience, if something we find a piece has been submitted to another journal, then we just just we, we reject it at that point. Um, it's it, um, basic rookie mistakes. Research the journal. It's amazing you put people put so much effort into their research in particular, but they don't actually necessarily look at the journal they're submitting to. So. What is its what's its author guidelines? Is it twelve thousand word pieces? Is it six thousand word pieces? What are they actually looking for, and who is their audience? Do some basic research on the journal. So, international affairs, our readership is both across the international relations academic spectrum and practitioners. So, you have to speak to both audiences. Other journals are more specialised. So, understand who you're speaking and engaging with, and what the journal's requirements are. In terms of the question about what do you get a, a um, they reject and then accept. We ask for three re references. Um, it's one of the it's one of the challenges as an editorial team is when you get two reviews in and you, you wonder whether that, that they've actually read the same thing because they've, they've come from completely opposite directions. Um, so we'd always have a third review in that respect. We only go generally go down to two reviews when the first two reviews come in and they're in agreement and we're in agreement with them and then we accept that the third review step down. So we would always make sure we've got at least two people two reviewers having a, a view of a, a particular review which we we tie into so i think um you bear that in mind and when we've had it uh, when we've had it and we've had the three reviews in so two say minor revisions one says reject we will point out where to ignore the comments on the reject one uh, but there was some but even within the reject feedback there was still valuable feedback in that in terms of why are they rejecting it there's, there's probably something in there that you still need to address Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Jan, did you want to jump in or should we move to the next question? Yeah, I can, can jump in very briefly. I'm yeah. amazed to, to hear my, my colleagues say that, um, talk about the, the fact that authors still submit articles to different journals at the same time. Uh, I would expect that's really not on and that's the, 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 the best way to burn uh, your academic career. Uh, um, on disagreeing with the reviewers, uh, I realize that is a, a very delicate process, and 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 for authors, uh, also there may be they may be tempted early career authors to please the reviewers just to get this accepted. And there is a point where you really have to to stand your ground and and be prepared to argue, as Halvard said, you make a good argument why you disagree with a re reviewer, and that is actually respected in this dialogue by the editor, and most oftentimes, mostly also by the by the reviewers. And there's a point to that when you when you just uh, agree with the reviewers across the board, you will regret that forever because when you reread your own article, uh, you will always come across that point where you where you think you've made a concession that you should never never have have made um, on discrepancy uh, that's really a discrepancy between two reviews uh, that is a moment where indeed we usually look for a third review but we also enter in a discussion in our team uh, and that's then my role uh, uh, to to discuss that with one or two of the other editors uh, uh, and and that is uh, sometimes a tough discussion but a very important moment and we also realize that it is important there to give authors sometimes uh, a chance uh, uh, because their background is is uh, uh, slightly different uh, uh, so that is uh, yeah that's an important moment uh, discrepancy uh, uh, it's 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 really that's where a discussion starts where you normally delegate tasks within the editorial team here we have a real discussion and i think the authors ultimately benefit from that thank you Jan. um so one more question or two related questions um, in terms of what we like to see as, as editors. So do you like to see submissions heavily weighted to either end? So either very conceptual, very theoretical work, or perhaps more empirical work in terms of the original contribution. Um, and secondly, um, 
should the author aims for reliance on, for example, new archival work, their own interviews, or can they get away with, if you like, with second resources only um, in their submission? Uh, Harvard, please. I think the the uh, EJR, we have sort of a very broad remit, right? We're supposed to take uh, articles from across the discipline of IR. And uh, so we we don't sort of start with any kind of prejudice. It's also in our article or in our journal description that we are weighed towards uh, the theoretical side. So if so purely empirical articles might be brilliant, but they might not pass uh, with us because we are looking for something more. As I said in my introduction, we're looking for something that speaks sort of beyond the article itself. Uh, that being said, as I also pointed out, there, there needs to be some sort of balance in that. Uh, unless you're writing a purely theoretical article, just having a purely theoretical argument, if, you, if you're planning to use empirics to demonstrate the validity of your new theoretical approach, then make sure that you have enough empirics to actually substantiate your claims, right? It's, it's a, it's a, there's no one-size-fits-all answer here. We, we will accept purely theoretical articles. We will probably not accept purely purely empirical articles, uh, but if you're using empirics, make sure that you they actually speak to the theory, that they actually make sense. Likewise, I said that there needs to be a fit between your theory and the empirics. Sometimes we, we have articles with brilliant empirics, but you think the theory is just slapped on because they want to uh, submit it to us. As to sort of, um, you need to have new empirical material, um, not, not necessarily. A lot of people who write in, in international relations rely on secondary sources. Uh, if you're making a theoretical argument, you're probably relying on, on secondary sources. But also if you're trying to sort of develop new thinking, let's say, for instance, the, <laughs> the historical research that I see a lot, um, the work that's been going on, on on the Eurasian developments in Eurasia over the last five, six, seven hundred years, on the steppe tradition or on the on the uh, on China and stuff like that, most people will be reliant on secondary sources, but they still use it to try to make new arguments, and that's perfectly fine. But again, it depends on what the topic is. There's again no no one size fits all. Some articles rely on secondary sources for obvious reasons. Others do uh, first hand uh, research on their own, uh, interviews or field work. It's also perfectly fine. Uh, again, for EJR, we take all kinds of articles. I Thank should have one one, yeah, one small one small thing on on things not to do. Um, if you're submitting, if you're resubmitting, if you've tried to submit somewhere else before and you're resubmitting to a new journal, this goes to Andrew's point. Do some research on the new journal. Uh, if you if you're sending an article that is just under ten thousand words to us and we have a twelve twelve thousand word limit, my hunch will be that this has been sent somewhere else before where they have a 10,000 word limit and you haven't really bothered to do anything about the article. That's a bad signal. Also, do change the name of the uh, the journal in the in the desk, in the in the cover letter. If you're submitting to the European Journal of International Relations, do not have international organization as you're submitting uh, article in the in the cover letter. Thank you, Robert. Can I just jump in with two, just two quick points based on what you just said. In terms of the cover letter, um, I would always, I know that for some journals it's um, compulsory to write, to submit a cover letter. For some journals it's not. Um, it's not for jokes, for example, but um, writing a good cover letter makes a big impression on the editor. Um, when you write a cover letter, you really need to uh, make a very clear case as to why this is uh, the right journal for this uh, submission. What is the contribution? How do you answer the, the so what question that we've all referred to so far? Um, what's original? What are the main findings, the main arguments and so on? Do not simply copy and paste the abstract of the paper. Okay. Um, it does make a big difference um, when, when you when you submit a cover letter. The second point, and I suppose it's a question to, to all of you, um, because I see it quite a lot with um, certainly some of my PhD students. What happens when we submit, or what should we do when we submit a manuscript? It's either desk rejected or it's rejected after the hour and hour. What do we do then um, when we submit it to a second journal or sometimes a third, a fourth and a fifth journal? Should we follow up on the reviewer's comments and revise the manuscript before we resubmit it? 
or should we assume that you know different people have different opinions and maybe the reviews of the second or third journals might actually like our original ideas so should we just take it as it is and resubmit it again or should we spend some time to to reflect on these comments and revise before we resubmit to to another journal um andrew would you like to go first thank you on that point i think it depends on why it was rejected so if it's rejected it's a classic what you know you, you, a piece comes in and i look at it and go this isn't for my journal i think it's for the journal another journal then that would imply actually you probably don't need to do so much work on that piece it's it's more applicable for that journal if it's gone through the review process and it's been rejected you've got a load of feedback use it just send it in even if you've done it two or three times look at what the feedback says you're being rejected for reasons look at what the feedback is so if it's straight rejection because you've gone for the wrong journal then go for the right journal and it, but if it's because you're you're getting feedback because the things that the reviewers are saying or the editorial teams think can be improved look into those before you resubmit that would be my feedback um second point which i would also make abstracts far too many people to just cut two lines from the introduction two lines from the conclusion and then that's their abstract if you think when we sent out using scholar one an invite to a reviewer to we send out the title and the abstract so the abstract's really important because actually it's what potential reviewers are going to look at to decide whether they're going to review this or not so if you're if you just if you put no effort into it it's going to really dis discourage reviewers from actually getting engaging with it. So be really, the abstract is a really important way of selling your piece. Um, cover letters to us, we don't, we're not interested in cover letters. You can put one in, but we generally read before, we want the piece read before cover letters is said, that explains what it's supposed to be doing. We want to see what it actually does in terms of an article. And the last, there's a question on about, if you're looking for additional help, um, for any social affairs, I, I'm guessing there's a box you tick where you, you submit a piece. So if you submit a piece and, and you want to look at the early career, the first diversity initiative, there's a box that you, you tick. It's, it's really quite simple. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, anyone else would like to, to chip in with any final thoughts or comments? Um, please, Halvard, yeah. Yeah, just on that, I think just to add on what Andrew said, I think you should also remember, particularly if you're writing on a, on a relatively specialized field, that the pool of reviewers will be limited. And the editors of the second or the third or the fourth journal might send out the article to uh, reviewers who have seen the piece before. And I can assure you, there's nothing that will make me less inclined to accept an article as a reviewer than seeing that this is an article I've seen before for a different journal and I've rejected it very clear and specific reasons and nothing has been done with the article that's a sort of you risk and particularly if you're sending to the same type of journal say you're sending it to a generalist ir journal there's not insignificant likelihood that someone i've uh, asked to review something might also be asked by Kristen to to review something right um this is something you want to avoid if, you, if you're ending up on at the table of the same reviewer make sure that you've actually done some work um because there's, as Andrew said, there's typically something in there, right? Your article can always become better. You might, if you disagree with the reviewer, then fine. Then you disagree with the reviewer, then don't do, don't do anything. But typically, there will be something there that can be useful, that can make your work better. And not doing that work is actually sort of a disservice to yourself and discipline. Thank you, Harvard. Um, anyone else? Yeah, uh, please. All right, Jan. Yeah. Yes, just on, on a couple of these points, uh, I was surprised myself to hear that you uh, attach a lot of importance to the, the cover letters. I seem to do that uh, to a lesser extent, uh, but I would like to, to second the, the observation that how important the abstract is, but also the title, the keywords, the conclusions. So it's a very quick scan that shows an editor uh, uh, whether an article is, is really uh, suitable for the journal or is, is passing the threshold uh, of uh, R&R &R in, in the first place. So keep revisiting that. Of course, also an article is a, a living document. Uh, so don't write the abstract in advance, but keep revising it uh, and also revise it when you revise, revise the, the article. Um, after rejection, just uh, to reiterate that point, 
uh, it's such a precious opportunity that you can learn from from why something's been rejected. To uh, and now we all know that uh, there are articles who reject it in one journal and they may end up in pole position in another journal. But I think the general rule is that we're here to learn, and 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 uh, it's a great opportunity to to have that kind of feedback. Even the rejection, I think we as editors we make an effort to give useful feedback, even if it's just three or four lines, and we do pay attention to that, again, because the authors are our, our capital. And authors, and I'd like to close on that note, also have certain rights. Uh, I hear sometimes frightening stories also outside of our field of how long authors have to wait for feedback. Keeping the momentum up in this process is, is very important, and that's where we have a role and a responsibility. Uh, our system tells us that the Hague Journal of Diplomacy has a reviewer turnaround time of less than a month uh, for two years now. That's hard work. It's also hard work and, and really paying attention to whom we ask as, as reviewers. Uh, uh, so that's rights that authors have, and, and I think we have to respect them. And it's, it, it's particularly at an early stage of the career, of course, authors would like to see their work out sooner rather than later, because they may be involved in job application uh, procedures, apply, apply for jobs, etc. cetera. Uh, so we, yeah, it's a responsibility that we have. Uh, and yeah, we're, I think all four of us, we're trying to do our best there. Thank you. And perhaps just to conclude on the note that, um, you know, when dealing with rejection, always remember it's not personal. We're not rejecting the individual. We're not questioning your academic um, ability or your intellectual prowesses. We are providing hopefully constructive feedback on the piece of work. Um, so never, never take it personally. That's really important. And the second thing, and I see it a lot when I speak to, uh, particularly to young colleagues at conferences, um, it's not in our interest as journal editors to reject every submission that we receive. It's it's in our interest to to publish good work. Um, journal editors are not the enemy. We are not the, the gatekeepers of academia who prevent good work from being published. So please remember that. Um, and if you're not sure if you have questions, absolutely, like Jan said, send an email to to the reviewer to to the journal editors if it's been a while and if you haven't heard anything. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, we will do our best to um, upload the link to this uh, webinar probably over the next few days on, on, on the website and we'll put it on our social media as well. Um, but for now, I think we're well over our time. So I'd like to thank our panelists very much for joining us today. I'd like to thank you all for attending and asking really good questions. Um, and hopefully we'll see many of you um, in San Francisco in April. Thank you.